Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone listening in today. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library and I'm very excited to host our talk today. Uh, a few logistics first. As an attendee, you are muted. So if you do have a question or a comment, please place that in the question panel. And I will uh, ask those questions at the end of our presentation, or I will share what comments you send in uh, via the broader chat. Uh, if you do have any issues uh, hearing or seeing the slides, try logging off and logging back into GoToWebinar. That solves most issues with the platform. Also, as a reminder, we are recording this. So if you do need to step away or if you would like to share this with a colleague, it will be recorded and placed on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. Now for our talk today. Uh, our talk is Observations of Arctic Mid-Latitude Weather Connections by Dr. James Overland, who is an oceanographer with NOAA and the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory over in Seattle. So this talk is going to be about the ongoing changes in the Arctic, um, especially since they add a new dryer, driver of severe weather that affects billions of people. Uh, so about our speaker today, Dr. Overland's professional interests are scientific support for decision makers on climate and ecosystems in the Arctic and subarctic. He leads projects on jet stream dynamics, Arctic changes in historical climate, climate and sea ice projections, and ecosystem impacts. Dr. Evelyn was the organizer for the NOAA Arctic Report Card Annual Summary, a recent Arctic assessment for the International Arctic Council, and was a lead author on the fifth IPCC assessment report. He has worked with NOAA biologists on endangered species and fisheries management. Having traveled to the Arctic as a student in the late 60s, he has since seen the Arctic change to a different place with loss of sea ice, temperature rise, and global impacts. And he also has been working for NOAA for the last 47 years. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Overland to talk us through his presentation today. Take it away. Hello from the shores of Puget Sound. Uh, we're waiting for our Seattle warm uh, heat event in a couple of days, but uh, it's not supposed to be as bad as the record setting one we had uh, a year ago. I'm going to talk about our mid-latitude uh, weather linkages. Uh, the linkages go both ways. They often occur with a wavy jet stream. And I'd like to acknowledge my uh, two co-authors who actually dig the uh, case studies. The next slide. Uh, as probably all you know, we've lost uh, half of the sea ice volume uh, in the Arctic uh, in the last uh, two decades. In addition, we have the delay of fall freeze up by two <coughs> two months uh, in the Bering Sea and the Bering Chukchi Sea. Uh, this delay allows the uh, open water areas in those marginal seas to interact with the beginning of the winter uh, storm tracks. Next slide. So the Arctic provides a new forcing function uh, for uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, weather, uh, but uh, the uh, impacts from the Arctic have to interact with the background atmosphere at random uh, circulation. Uh, so this puts uh, uncertainty into the issue if the storm tracks are well south of the Arctic in a given year, there's no interaction. It takes uh, the uh, polar vortex and the uh, storm tracks to be uh, uh, close. Uh, and I'll uh, note uh, two case studies uh, here today. 
Yeah, the next slide. There are three main processes involved with uh, the linkage of the Arctic with the uh, Northern Hemisphere weather. The most straightforward one is uh, open water, sea ice free areas can provide a, a, a heating source uh, from the uh, bottom. Uh, some models uh, are run without sea ice, but uh, uh, they, that's not the whole story. There's two other major impacts. Uh, the first one is that uh, the polar vortex uh, uh, jet stream needs to align with uh, the location of the uh, arc uh, forcing. Uh, and then once the event starts, you can uh, exact bring in uh, heat and moisture uh, that uh, helps to continue uh, and uh, uh, makes the persistence uh, longer. Uh, next slide. So the first case I have is from winter 2017-18. Uh, the uh, winter 2018 was an uh, all-time minimum sea ice extent uh, year for uh, uh, the northern Bering Shakshi. Uh, the figure on the left is surface temperatures and there's uh, six degree anomalies over the Bering Strait region for uh, several months. Uh, warm temperatures, uh, the air is less dense. That increases the vertical separation between pressure levels in the lower atmosphere and uh, that ends up uh, rise, raising the uh, geopotential heights halfway up in the atmosphere, which is shown in the, the middle uh, figure. So there's a bowing of uh, the uh, pressure levels and the winds follow the, those contours. So we, have what they call a ridge over northern uh, Alaska that uh, combines with the climatological ridge trough system over North America and uh, can bring cold air to the central and eastern uh, United States as shown in the uh, third slide on the right. So we, we can have cold temperatures uh, over the continental US in response to the warm uh, temperatures. So this, this pattern has been called the warm arctic cold continents pattern. Uh, next slide. Here's a model vertical cross section uh, for this case, uh, the red uh, colors note that the surface temperatures can reach well halfway up into the uh, atmosphere. And the contours show that uh, there is also uh, moist, uh, warm air uh, intruding into the area that also keeps the temperatures warm. The bottom figure shows that over the Bering Strait region, you can have uh, sustained 30 watts of upward heat flux uh, that help to maintain the event, but surface forcing is not the only uh, mechanism that's uh, working here. Next slide.
Oh, you don't have to read all of this, but uh, the uh, loss of sea ice and warm temperatures uh, has a major impact on uh, the northern ecosystem and uh, the uh, food security and livelihoods of uh, residents. Uh, there was loss of commercial crab, uh, reduced salmon runs in, in the Yukon. And my colleagues from NOAA Fisheries are noting that the Pacific cod and, and Alaskan pollock uh, were found uh, where they hadn't been before in the northern Bering Sea. Uh, Pacific cod is a major uh, predator and was probably chowing down on uh, the larva and lower uh, forage fish species that was, so we're looking at a total reorganization of, of the uh, uh, Northern Bering Sea ecosystem with uh, major societal uh, impacts. Uh, next slide. So the figure on the left shows the amount of sea ice in the Bering Sea uh, for all the different years. And you can see the minimums there in 2018 and 19, but there's been basically uh, low sea ice and warm temperatures since 2014. This year is particularly interesting that the jet stream was well south of the uh, uh, Bering Sea and the Aleutians, uh, which allowed northerly winds to flow. And so at the beginning of the year, we thought, well, this is going back to more typical conditions. But uh, what we found was uh, even though the ice extent was near normal, the ice was very thin and broken up and, and the local residents uh, you know, called it rotten ice. And uh, we're just starting to get uh, some confidence in the satellite uh, calculation of sea ice thickness, especially when, when the signal is really large. And, on the right is a figure done by a University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, based on the satellite data. And the brown areas show that the ice was less than a third uh, of the thickness that uh, it had been over the previous 10 years. And not only is there uh, thin ice in the Bering Sea, but uh, there was uh, thinner ice north of Alaska uh, that uh, continues uh, sea ice loss and uh, warm temperatures in every year in the central Alaska. Uh, next slide. So moving to the bigger picture of what, what's going on, the, uh, the wedge in the center at the top are the climatological uh, air temperatures uh, over the Northern Bering region. And uh, uh, there's an Arctic front, a strong difference between air masses between the cold, dry Arctic air and, and the warmer uh, Bering Sea uh, air. Uh, these uh, temperature gradients, north-south temperature gradients, uh, convert to a north-south pressure gradient. Uh, an example is on the uh, upper uh, right, and these uh, north-south pressure gradients are not only at the surface, they go well up into the 
atmosphere. So historically, you know, forever, <coughs> there's this uh, winter barrier of the Arctic front that uh, keeps the cold air locked into the uh, Arctic and, and keeps the storms uh, south of Bering Strait. Uh, what we've found in the last five years, though, is because the Arctic is warming five degrees and it, it's warming faster than the mid latitudes, it's weakening that Arctic front. And in the lower right are uh, uh, pressures from uh, the last five years. And there's there's uh, the Arctic front over Bering Strait is basically uh, collapsed, uh, and that allows cold air to come down. But also, if if the storm track is well south of the Bering, nothing much happens. But if the track is curving into the Bering, there's nothing to stop it from moving north uh, into the Arctic. So we have a, a positive feedback between loss of ice, warm temperature, and uh, southerly winds on storm tracks. And uh, this is underway right now, and, and it's happening much sooner than uh, uh, global climate models are showing. And this uh, breakdown of the Arctic front is why we think the frequency of these uh, low sea ice uh, winters and impacts on the uh, ecosystem and coastal communities, the frequency will continue within the, the next decade. Uh, next slide. So I'm, I'm now going to flip you over to the other side of the Arctic, uh, north of Norway. You can see the Scandinavian peninsula in the center uh, of the uh, Arctic map. The blue areas are where the polar vortex is very strong, but the uh, uh, but what happened in this case around uh, New Year's for 2016 is there's a breakdown of the polar vortex with a real weakening, and that initiates uh, one of these uh, mid latitude uh, events. There's uh, blocking over the Ural Mountains and uh, uh, cold temperatures that can reach Eastern Asia. So uh, here's an example of, of the uh, large-scale atmosphere uh, setting up the pattern. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so if we look at the forcing uh, at lower levels, the event uh, uh, starts uh, around New Year's where it says uh, 2016. Uh, before that, in the red curve, there was heat flux up from the surface uh, that helped initiate the pattern uh, as well. And then after it starts, there was invection of uh, heat and moisture uh, from the uh, shown in the green line. If you bring uh, moist air into the region, it tends to trap uh, the warm air. And that, that's why uh, uh, we use the long wave down as the proxy. Uh, the other thing to note on this figure is both of these forcing the, the warm air, uh, moisture evection and the surface uh, continue 
for the following two months in January and February, and they they help to uh, add to the persistence of of these types of events. So next slide. So to summarize, I've shown two examples of Arctic mid latitude uh, weather. Uh, the Chuck CC has a warm uh, ice free event over Alaska and a downstream cold event uh, over eastern uh, the US. Uh, the Barents Sea uh, sea ice loss event uh, and, and the, uh, <coughs> uh, continues the uh, the uh, was initiated by the large scale uh, weather and helped set up uh, blocking over the Urals and then uh, cold air uh, out over uh, Eastern Eurasia. So <coughs> these uh, two events are are uh, event based and regional. Often after the events, you have uh, warm air. So if you average over the winter or a large area, they don't show up. But uh, the reason we know they're occurring is on a event regional basis. Uh, they have some persistence, which is why they're of interest for subseasonal forecast casting and uh, they have downstream events from uh, the Arctic in the mid latitudes, uh, often with a cold influence. Uh, and uh, based on the weakening of the Arctic front or uh, projecting that we'll have more of these low uh, Bering Sea sea ice years with eco continuing ecosystem and, and uh, societal impacts. And I'm knowing that uh, there's not just one sea ice loss process, but there are three processes that are all important to uh, these uh, events. So thanks very much. And we've got time here for questions, comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Evelyn. Uh, yes, we do have plenty of time. I know we're not going to hold this uh, for a whole hour. So uh, if you do have a question, uh, please put that in the question panel. But I'm just, I'm going to ask one off the top of my head that I, you know, I am not an expert in this area, but I would love to know um, what is your, what is your prediction for this winter? If you, if you would uh, have, if you have an opinion or a thought on what this winter is going to look like upcoming. Well, that. <clears throat> That's always a good question, and, and uh, uh, you know my my worst forecast was after 2018 with, with an ice loss that we'd never seen before that had had a large random uh, comment uh, to it, and I said, well, you know, the next year it's going to be more uh average but we had two back-to-back -back, uh extreme uh sea ice uh minimums in 18 and 19 so uh, you know what uh what the wavy jet stream does is uh, hard to predict uh that out but with a little El Nino or uh or Longing, you know, the, the jet stream can be a little more uh, 
south like it was uh, this last winter. But uh, as I pointed, you know, the, the, uh, the warming and sea ice loss are wide and the real thinning uh, has already changed uh, the uh, uh, background condition. So the, you know, I would say it's going to look a lot like uh, this year where the, uh, the jet stream isn't contributing very much, but we're already in, in a uh, low sea ice uh, uh, ecosystem impact and societal impact uh, situation. Great, thank you. I don't see any questions yet, so maybe someone is typing a question, but is there is there a question we should be asking you? Yeah, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the whole thing, issue of mid-latitude weather connections is uh, uh, a real complex issue. As I said, that some years with the jet stream to the south, you know, you have no uh, real tie to the Arctic. So the, the mid-latitude connections don't occur in, it, in every year. And so, uh, if you average things out uh, over multiple years or over, over any given winter, you don't necessarily uh, see the, the uh, uh, event. You have to really look on a case by case regional uh, basis. So. Uh, you know, there's there's still much more work to be done. Uh, the key point I'm I'm making is uh, with uh, my colleagues from you know, fisheries and and uh, uh, sea grant and residents around Nome is that uh, the uh, uh, these the impacts can last multiple years. So you may have uh, uh, a major extreme event in one or two years, but we're we're seeing their impacts uh, and continue for multiple years. So that's why it's really important for NOAA to flag the ongoing uh, uh, changes in the Northern Bering Sea. Thanks, Dr. Erlen. We did get some questions from uh, folks who I think have a better handle on your topic than myself. Uh, first question is, uh, do you think small features like polar tropopause vorte vor vortices have a significant impact on surface ice evolution? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, that's why I I am highlighting internal variability that uh, the movement of the polar vortex and, and uh, uh, the splitting of the vortex or its movement over uh, continents is really important on the uh, setup of uh, uh, these uh, features. So, uh, so doing uh, art wide averages uh, of, of the strength of the polar vortex is uh, not uh, nearly as good as looking at these uh, smaller scale features and, and how they move and, and can uh, interact uh, with uh, what's going on in the art on the Arctic, that all three of these processes really need to be uh, in in play before you can, can have a, a strong uh, event. Is there um, another question here? Is there anything like this uh, that's happened in previous decades or centuries even, uh, for example, like the Little Ice Age in Europe? Um, 
cold air outbreaks uh, in Europe and, and Eastern U.S. and Asia, you know, are are a long term uh, phenomenon, and uh, you know, uh, have occurred have occurred for forever, and uh, so uh, uh, you don't need necessarily the uh, uh, ice to go away to uh, uh, have an event. The polar vortex can simply move down over North America uh, and in the uh, uh, Siberian high can uh, increase. Uh, and that, that's the same with uh, uh, Europe that uh, uh, you have uh, cold high pressure to the east, and that can uh, move down and, and help uh, set that up. And so the you know the the uh, ice ages and, and the uh, the uh, the cold uh, uh, periods, the little ice age, and so on. Are are mostly uh, uh, related to uh, the movement of these uh, uh, atmospheric features, uh, but but I think you're also thinking in terms of increasing the probability that uh, uh, we think that uh, warmer temperatures in the North Pacific uh, can, can help. Uh, lock in these uh, extreme patterns that that rather than just random cold and warm uh, storms that that the, the the surface can increase the probability of of staying in in a cold pattern. So uh, so cold weather has always been around, but we think that the Arctic uh, can help uh, reinforce that. We know that from the surface effect, and and a lot of research is going on on what the polar vortex is doing now, and and there's a lot of uh, analogs uh, in history as well. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, there's about three more questions so I'm gonna get through. Um, this one's a bit of a two-parter. What do you think of uh, the role of tropical climate variability, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation in driving the atmospheric and sea ice variability? Is the tropical influence much weaker than the mid-high latitude internal processes? Uh, this is, this is one of the uh, controversial uh, questions in in the uh, in the field. Uh, there are several papers that discuss this. I think, as, as I mentioned, uh, you know the the logging, uh, keeping the uh, jet stream south over uh, the continental U.S. Uh, certainly is is a uh, uh, a feature but it's just one factor and and uh, my personal opinion is the the strength of what the jet stream is actually doing over uh the northern uh over the sub arctic and uh, uh its tie with the local uh loss of ice is the the bigger factor, but uh, uh, tropical cannot be uh, totally ruled out. And it's one of these probabilistic uh, uh, features. Related to uh, local, more local differences, is there a relation between the Pacific warm blob and the Chukchi ice reduction? Uh, if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have said no, but today I'm saying 
yes, that uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> the warm the warm temperatures in the North Pacific tie in with warm temperatures in the uh, uh, subarctic uh, Bering Strait region. All of those warm temperatures uh, helps to lock in that uh, uh, long wave ridge trough uh, wavy jet stream over the uh, U.S. So uh, uh, it's a question of uh, I don't I don't think the blob by itself uh, would would be strong enough to impact it, but but the, the two in combination are one of these uh, ways that we get uh, new events, new climate events that we've never seen before. And, and I think the Pacific uh, uh, Arctic connection is one of them. Great, thank you. Okay, last couple questions here. So we we referred kind of back to your original prediction, possible prediction for the upcoming uh, winter. Even with uh, starting La Nina, do you think that the sea ice this year will be thin? Uh, yes, I, I, I would think we will have something similar to the uh, thin ice that, that I had. And that, that has to do more with uh, the overall warming of the Arctic that uh, uh, north of Alaska, that warming shows up uh, every year and uh, that that delays the uh, uh, freeze up and uh, doesn't give as much time for uh, the ice to grow that than it used to. So I stick stick my head out and say, you know, I don't think we're going to have uh, the warm jet stream part, but I, I think uh, the the thin ice and, and uh, the negative impacts are are here to stay. The, the strength, I think, will vary from year to year, but uh, the frequency of of the thin ice and, and lack of ice uh, will continue in the next decade. And we're talking the next decade. We're not talking about two or three decades from from now that the uh, global models show. Great, thank you. I think that was our last uh, major question. So. Uh, We'll wrap this up by asking, since uh, we are kind of moving in that direction of either less sea ice coverage or at least thinner sea ice, how are these um, impacts going to affect the North Pacific, the Gulf of Alaska, and, and North? Well, I think, I think the main impacts of are going to be in the northern bearing because you're converting uh, an, an Arctic ecosystem to more of a mid latitude uh, system, as I uh, mentioned, with, with the cog being a new uh, predator. Uh, the uh, the southeast Bering Sea and, and the North Pacific is well within the movement of, of the normal uh, storm track and and the Aleutian low moving around. So uh, for, for instance, uh, this last winter, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Southeast Bering Sea was more of a typical uh, uh, temperature and, and ice from uh, previous uh, decades with with the storm track being uh, further south and, and uh, 
uh, La Nina would tend to go along with that. So I don't see any real direct our impact on uh, the Southeast Bering Sea or, or, or the North Pacific. I think uh, the variability in the North Pacific is really its, its main feature. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Overland. That is the end of our questions and I'm going to wrap us up. I want to thank you for giving this fantastic talk and remind everybody we did record it. And if you have uh, questions for Dr. Overland that you didn't get asked here, you can always reach out to him via email. I also believe he will be giving this uh, talk again shortly at a conference, correct? Yeah, if people would like to email me with the uh, uh, comments or questions. Uh, I'm open to that. I, I'm also trying to collect uh, examples of extreme events that we haven't seen before. The the bearing is certainly one, and and the early wildfire season in Alaska is a, another one. But if if you're noting. Uh, your favorite one, let me know. Great, thank you so much. I've put uh, Dr. Overland's email in the chat here. It's uh, james.e.overland at noaa.gov. And I wanna thank everyone for coming out today and listening to our presentation. And again, thank you, Dr. Overland. I'm going to close it out and hope everyone has a safe and wonderful rest of their Tuesday. We did have a comment that there's a lot of lightning out in, Chuch in the Chuchki Sea. So thank you for that comment. <laughs> Take care, everyone.